Let's get ready to rumble! Well, here's the debate. And it's basically along the lines that Alexander Yusek is being overlooked. Well, he's not being overlooked. The facts are, he's had three world title fights, heavyweight title fights. Anthony Joshua has had 12, nine wins. When Anthony Joshua does win, he looks more spectacular than Yusek. Knockouts cause amnesia. Anthony Joshua is one of the faces of boxing, hardcore and casual. Yeah? Yusek doesn't have that same world appeal as Joshua. It is what it is. Yusek didn't earn multi-million dollar purses like he earned until he fought Anthony Joshua. He earned well against Bellew and Del Boy. They sold well and he made good money, very good money, don't get me wrong. But nothing like the purses that he got in Saudi Arabia in the rematch. The first fight, he just got the standard mandatory purse. Anthony Joshua, it is what it is, yeah? He's the face of boxing. He brought the heavyweight division back to life. He brought money back into boxing stadium fights. The Saudi Arabia phenom we're witnessing now, he's the main man who drove that forward. Tyson Fury claimed he pioneered the Saudi Arabia movement when he didn't. Yusik cannot speak the common language which most boxing fans speak, and that's English. Can't speak it. And in all truth, he doesn't really crave the limelight like that. Just like Anthony Joshua doesn't, to be honest. Yusek is not like the previous Ukraine world champions, the Klitschko brothers. He's not like them, right? When they started as pros, they couldn't speak a word of English. But these guys were about marketing and money and business. And then within a few years, they were speaking fluent English. Yusek's not even making an attempt to do so. That's somebody who's not concerned about being a marketing tool. He's not concerned about that. Yusek is on some fuck you, pay me. And he's representing the struggle in the Ukraine currently. I tell you what, you do the research on the Klitsch goes in their prime. And you go look up all the endorsements and advertising and business opportunities they took advantage of. Correctly so, so they should. If that's what you want to do, that's what you should do. And they took full advantage of that. Yusek doesn't do that. He's a bit of a quirky, cheeky guy. He's very confident. Don't get it twisted. He's not like in the corner hiding, but he's not craving the spotlight. So you guys can't say he's overlooked when he doesn't put himself out there like that. Alexander Yusek took 50-50 in the rematch with Anthony Joshua in Riyadh. 50-50. About $75 million a piece. He had all three straps. After that, in what... Most people thought should have been a 50-50 split with Tyson Fury. He submitted to 70-30 in Fury's favour. And Fury started laughing at him. Can't speak English. In the Ukraine, Germany and parts of Europe he's huge. But the more common territories where big fights have taken place. US. More the UK these days. He can't compete on a worldwide basis with Anthony Joshua or Tyson Fury. In terms of negotiations, he's not as popular. Boxing is not like football, where if you play for the season, your wage is structured. If you're on the field, management, coaching, physio, strength, conditioning, nutritionist, your wage is structured for the season or how many seasons you're contracted. Boxing doesn't work like that. Boxing is create your own lane. Regardless if there's sanctioning belts there or not, boxing is you create your own lane and your own threshold on how much money you can earn. Prize fighting. That's why Mike Tyson and Jake Paul are going to clean up in America and leave any other fight, whether it's Terence Crawford, Canelo, Errol Spence, Deontay Wilder in the dust. Jerry Cooney, the challenger for Larry Holmes' WBC title in 1982, I believe. I didn't fact check. He got 20 million as the challenger. The same as Larry Holmes. The champion, the lineal champion, who had a considerable amount of defenses behind him. Part of the deal was Cooney comes out second, like he's the champion, not Holmes. You see, at that time, they wouldn't come out and say it blatantly. Although in certain boxing magazines, they still use that term white hope. That was still in playing boxing. And Holmes had to eat it. He could not earn like that anywhere else. And I've still got to make the disclaimer, and I've already mentioned it in the video, I think Alexander Yusek is the top heavyweight. I think 
Anthony Joshua is second. And I think the gap between second and third, which is Tyson Fury, is getting wider. You see, the thing is, without a Joshua wins, whether Yusek had belts or not, without them Joshua wins, he wouldn't be the number one heavyweight. That's the most valuable scalp out of Fury beating Wilder. Joshua is a bigger scalp as a feather in Yusek's cap. That's the biggest scalp. That's how that conundrum of Fury, Wilder, Yusek, Joshua has played out. That's how it's aged over the last nine years since the Klitschko reign ended and Wilder, Yusek. Fury and AJ started picking up belts. Joshua is the bigger win. That's why I have Usyk number one. Wilder is one of the biggest hype jobs in modern American boxing. He hasn't beaten a Klitschko. He hasn't beaten a Usyk. He hasn't beaten a Fury. He hasn't unified no straps. Hasn't done none of that. The reason Usyk is number one is because of the two Anthony Joshua wins. The reason he's going into the fight as the betting favourite it's partly because of the two Joshua fights, but it's more than that. It's not just what Yusek has accomplished. Anthony Joshua's last two fights against two common opponents with Tyson Fury has badly shook the bookmaker's confidence in him and the general public. Plus the way he acted in negotiation with Yusek hasn't helped his reputation one bit. And if Yusek trounces him, he's going to be in the fucking mud, getting buried all day. But let me say this, if you're a Yusek fan, whether you're an extreme fanboy or just someone who appreciates his craft and his accomplishments, if Yusek loses, he'll be subject to the judgment that social media passes on boxers, where they're not looking at your whole body of work. They're just going to say, well, we knew AJ wasn't that good and we knew Yusek wasn't that good. Oh, we always knew Tyson Fury was all that. While right now, Fury's name is Mud. And that's exactly what social media does. It'll be a tough loss for either man because I think a lot of people are weighing it up. The winner is not going to be looking to take that rematch immediately. They're not. They're going to want to hold on to that win if it's a legit win. Not if Fury's eye pops open early or it's a controversial ending, unsatisfactory. But the winner, the winner is going to hold on to the strap and try and politic some propaganda where they can justify that they don't have to rematch Fury immediately. They don't have to take on AJ next, who's the top contender. That's what is a likely scenario, depending on how watertight their rematch clauses are or how persuasive Turkey and his people are in what they want next. There's a lot of people speculating that the winner is likely to retire. You tell me what Tyson Fury fan wouldn't be rubbing it in the AJ fan's face if Fury had knocked out five common opponents to AJ's one. Has got two knockouts over ranked opponents consecutively in recent times. All the people who are trying to rebuttal me on Twitter. I don't think AJ's all that. That's all you have. Talking absolute crap. You go out on the big stage. Fighting for millions and millions of pounds. Knocking out ranked contenders. While your peer is struggling with points wins against them. And that means nothing historically. Out of respect, I give Yusek the top spot. Out of respect. But as a heavyweight, he hasn't done as much as AJ. And he's not going to either. He's probably going to retire if he beats Fury conclusively. And I don't blame him. But he doesn't have 12 heavyweight fights. He doesn't have the knockouts AJ has. He didn't bring the money back into the game. If he does beat Fury and decides to fight AJ again, what's the negotiation going to be like? Is he going to say, well, I demand a higher split? Probably not. Probably not. Because whether you like it or not, they're going to be archiving that knockout Anthony Joshua scored against Ngannou for a little while. He's been the best heavyweight to watch in the last, let's say, six, seven, eight months. When's the last time Fury beat a ranked contender? Derek Chisora wasn't ranked until the WBC gave him a ranking so they could accommodate Fury's voluntary. People still haven't forgot Yusek laying on the floor, twitching, after the borderline body shot that Daniel Dubois hit him with. I thought it was low. But a lot of people think it's a legal punch. And this is what I'm saying. It's not just your opinion. It's not just my opinion. But there is a perception of how all the fighters look. You can say whatever you like. And a lot of people weren't impressed with how Yusek reacted in that situation. It wouldn't matter if Ngannou had no MMA or combat sports experience. Tyson Fury brought that guy alive. 
all you may say is, unless you've got the receipts to say you knew AJ was going to blow him out this early, can't really take what you're saying seriously. When there's actual boxers who predicted AJ to lose, there's actual coaches like Zhang's coach, Sean George, who predicted not only for AJ to lose, but for him to get knocked out. There was lots of polls which had Ngannou ahead. Now, whether they was caught up in the hype or not, these are the stakes you play for in boxing. That's why AJ was paid so much, and that's why Ngannou was paid so much, because people were intrigued to find out what will happen when these two behemoths get in the ring. Now, just because Joshua cleaned him out, and some of you ain't comfortable with that, because now, how do you sell Tyson Fury as this Muhammad Dali of this era, like some of you have tried to? I'm not calling you a hater, but you're not comfortable with that. You can't be telling me that this fight doesn't mean anything. If Ngannou had beaten Anthony Joshua, it would mean something very scary for boxing. It would mean that you could go through the pedigrees of amateur career, Olympics, doing well in the Olympics, pro career, and you could go through this honing process that boxers go through that perfects them into these boxing machines. And a big man who knows how to punch quite well can just knock you out if he's big and strong enough. So that would mean the end of boxing, as far as I'm concerned. You know, AJ's not fighting no ranked contenders. He signed to fight Deontay Wilder, who was ranked just as high as he was, so they could have their big showdown to establish a super contender. And Wilder lost this fight. In boxing... You have to clean up spillages. That's what you do, yeah? Fury left the spillage with Ngannou and AJ cleaned it up. People were arguing on Twitter when I state that Joshua beat Wallin, number one ranked contender, and then Ngannou was ranked number 10 or 9, was it? By the WBC, two ranked contenders on the trot by stoppage. Who's doing that is why I asked. And then they came with shit like, you surely can't be basing it off rankings. Rankings can be bought. Like, yes, it's true. Rankings can be bought, and they often are bought. But you're basically pissing in the wind now. Am I expected to debate with you on Twitter over speculation about who bought rankings? All I know is Otto Wallin fought an eliminator against Gassiev and won it, and had at least a six-fight winning streak or whatever it is since he gave Fury the war and nearly stopped him on cuts legitimately. That's all I know. Ngannou was ranked on the strength of his performance against Fury, who's supposedly the top heavyweight of our era. Am I making it up? No, I'm not making it up. What is not anecdotal is Joshua fought both opponents who were ranked and stopped him. And he was going to fight Deontay Wilder who was ranked just as high as him as well. And Wilder flopped. If AJ beats Joseph Parker, ah, oh, Parker's passed it. He never was that good. AJ beat him already. Parker got floored by Zhang. He got floored by Derek. That's what you're going to do. But for some reason, if you don't see it their way, you're an AJ fanboy. When the statistics, not anecdotal bullcrap and revisionist history, will tell you different. If he fights Hagovic, you're not going to give him credit for that. You're going to say, look, how Hagovic looked against Zhang and Dempsey McKinney. He's not going to get credit for that. If he fought Ajit Kabayel, oh, well, he sparred him already because that's what they said about Otto Wallin. Yeah, he sparred Otto Wallin eight years ago. Eight years ago. Oh, he fought him twice in the amateurs and beat him. He also fought Dillian in the amateurs, AJ, and lost to him. He's also sparred Daniel Dubois. He's also sparred Joe Joyce. So I guess he can't fight them guys because he's got an advantage on them. It's weird how the advantage of sparring someone years ago only works in AJ's favour when, in theory, doesn't Otto Wallin know as much about AJ as AJ knows about him. And there was a lot of people picking Otto Wallin to beat Anthony Joshua. Let's not forget that before we play this in hindsight game. This Monday morning quarterback bullcrap. Let me give my assessment on this situation with Andre Ward and his obsession with telling us about this Anthony Joshua fight he said he was going to take. He said he was going to move up to cruiserweight and fight Bellew for the WBC belt and then when he feels comfortable at 200 pounds he was going to take on Anthony Joshua. And he's mentioned this a few times. Now this is just my opinion. Andre Ward is not one of the most charismatic American fighters. He just isn't. He is however a good role model. Father, married man, God-fearing man. Credit do. And I think he's trying to reinvent himself a little. He's got these documentaries. He might have a book coming out. Now he's telling us um, how he had addiction issues. He was smoking and drinking. Trying to make himself, I guess, look um, a bit more... You know, make himself look edgy, as Cedric the Entertainer would say. He's trying to be edgy. Because most people see him as just a bland guy who did very well in a ring. But why is he so desperate to tell us? 
about he was going to fight AJ. Why is that so important to let us know that? When he didn't make a step towards actually doing it. You see, like, I can go back to Bob Fitzsimmons. He started at, what was it? I think he, what order did he go in? I can't remember what order, but he won light heavyweight middle and heavyweight. He actually moved up to heavy and did it. He didn't talk about it. Tommy Lauren, he was a light heavyweight. He challenged Primo Canera for the title. Heavyweight title, 84 pounds weight difference between the two. Six foot six was Canera. Lauren was about six foot. Archie Moore, he beat contenders like Nino Valdez. Big heavyweight at the time. He fought Rocky Marciano. He fought Ali when he was an old man. Bob Foster, he challenged Joe Frazier for the heavyweight title. Ali for the North American. He fought several heavyweights. He got beaten by Ernie Terrell, Doug Jones. He never won none of his heavyweight fights, but he's a prolific light heavy. You know, you go to Michael Spinks. He moved up to heavy and beat Larry Holmes, the lineal champion. He beat him twice. These guys didn't talk about it. They did it. Roy Jones, he started at light middle and won that heavyweight strap from John Ruiz. James Tony, he started at middle. He beat John Ruiz for... I believe a vacant WBA strapped. He popped for steroids, but he fought Samuel Peter. He fought Holyfield. He fought Hussey and Rutman. He fought loads of fights at heavy. Loads. But he's basically trying to reinvent his career to make it more interesting than what we remember it as. And he had some good nights. He had some very good nights. Beating Kovalev with the nut shots. Controversially outpointing him in the first fight. The Carl Froch fight. Winning the Super, was it six tournament? He had some good nights. But I don't think he's satisfied with the way people perceive him to be as an ex-fighter. I don't think he's comfortable with it. A lot of people said he retired prematurely, Andre. And I think he still wants to fight as well. I think that's what a lot of this is about. Dwight Muhammad Kawi, WBC light heavyweight champion. Who remembers when he went up to heavy and fought George Foreman? He was five foot six. He's about five six, Dwight Muhammad Kawi. But he was giving George them hands in the first Five or six rounds and then George got him out of there. He didn't talk about it. He went up there and did it. Mickey Walker was a welterweight, a middleweight champion. And me and Mr. Doc always crack up laughing when we reflect upon him challenging Max Schmeling, who was a former heavyweight champion at the time. He's outsized significantly. But he approached the fight like he was the bigger man. He was trying to push Schmeling back and be aggressive. And he got knocked out badly. Sam Langford from lightweight to heavy beat a slew of world-class boxers, champions in every weight class from lightweight to heavy. Ezra Charles, I'm going to say it, might have the best boxing resume in the history of the sport. From middleweight to heavyweight. Young Stribbling, he fought from feather to heavy. William Young Stribbling. You don't talk about it. You get out there and do it if you're really about that life. You can't tell us you're a super athlete. But yet, the evidence isn't there. And on social media, on Twitter, numbskulls bought into it that Andre could beat Anthony Joshua. Not asking themselves, like, if you didn't have the heart to type 175 against Adonis, or go up to 200 pound and face Bellew, what makes me believe you could beat Anthony Joshua? Is this the stuff that he's going to be putting in these documentaries or books? Stuff that he was going to do or thinking about doing? How about stick to stuff that you did, succeeded or failed at, but stuff that you did? Like, I can talk about stuff that Andre Ward never did, that the fans were critical that he never attempted, like go to Canada and take that IBF belt from Lucy and Butte. He let Carl Froch back in the game when Matram brought Butte to Nottingham and Carl Froch knocked him all about the place and took the strap, let Froch back in the game. Didn't fight Stieglitz, didn't clean out the whole of 168, if that's the case. Some people talk about he didn't fight his mandatory but Turby ever retired. He didn't go for undisputed against Adonis Stevenson. He said some shit like Adonis didn't deserve the fight. No one's going to summarize his career and be saying, oh, you didn't fight Anthony Joshua. They're going to say, no, you didn't fight Baturbi if you didn't fight Adonis. You didn't fight Butte. You didn't tie up all the straps at 168 or 175. That's what they're going to say. They're going to say you didn't get a lot of knockouts. You wasn't entertaining. You head by Kessler into defeat. You're not shotted Kovalev into defeat. And a lot of people are going to say he was boring. I don't think he was that boring like people are saying, to be honest. But that's a wide perception of his career. Yeah, like, fair enough. Chad Dawson really pissed me off. I, I, I used to like Chad Dawson when he said he'd drop down to 168 to fight him. And Andre accepted. If you're bad enough to fight Anthony Joshua, you should have moved up to 175 and fought that man. That's what you should have did. But you accepted the catch weight. 
even though, you know, Chad talked himself into it. I see Andre fighting Paul Smith on one of his comeback fights after the Goose and Tutor issues. And Paul Smith caught him with a full-blooded power shot. Can't remember from which hand. And I'm not saying Andre wobbled all over the place, but it stopped him dead in his tracks. But he's going to take Anthony Joshua's power. But what's the point of me going that far into what he would do and wouldn't do against Joshua? He didn't even take the Bellew fight. He didn't even go to Cruiser. If he had fought and knocked off Bellew at Cruiser, then this debate could be more of a tangible talking point that you would have went to heavyweight because that's the next weight class after Cruiser. But his career ended at 175 with food on the table that he didn't clean up. Good defensive fighter. Decked by Darnell Boone. Decked by Kovalev. Showed good powers and recovery. Doesn't have the longest reach for a super middleweight or light heavy. 16 out of 32 wins inside the distance. 50% knockout ratio. Compared to Joshua, 25 inside the distance in 28 wins at heavyweight. Only the numbskulls on Twitter who think I'm going to go back and forth with them over this idiotic claim from Ward would take this serious. With all the examples that I mentioned there who actually moved up, I'm talking about lightweights and featherweights who fought heavyweights. He had more than enough opportunities to fight cruiserweights and heavyweights and never did. Now he claims he retired because he was injured but 32 fights. There's not a lot of fights. One more fight than what Joshua's had. Joshua has 31 fights. And a lot of people are wondering, did he just run because he didn't want to lose that undefeated record? Uh.